Good morning. Good morning. Uh, our announcement this, this morning. Oh, here we are. Thank you. I was. Our announcements this morning are not printed here where they're supposed to be, right in front of me. Good morning, all. So off the top of my head. No. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, the next care day uh, will be November 4th and 5th, which is not next weekend, but the weekend after that. See Donna Morris, who is not with us this morning, um, but will be back next week. Uh, and care day means caring for the buildings and the church grounds. If you'd like to join in that activity, please see Donna. Trunk or treat happens on October 24th from 4.30 to 6.30. Please contact Caroline McDonald. Caroline, would you just raise your hand for those who might not know you and um, if, if you're interested in participating or donating to that activity. Um, I just want to say one thing. You're talking about trunk or treat? Yes. Trunk or treat is Tuesday, so um, time is running out. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> time. Here. It's at the Senior Center. Uh, and we were asking for donations of candy. So, Caroline, I'm going to re-say that so everybody on Zoom can also hear. So, Trunk or Treat is this Tuesday from 4.30 to 6.30 in the parking lot of the Senior Center. Did I get that correctly? Yes. And um, donations of candy would be welcome. And uh, so please let Caroline know. I will be in my office tomorrow morning in the parish house from 9 to noon for in-person office hours. Uh, if you would like to come in, please, um, you may need to ring the bell at the back door a few times. Do not be, do not hesitate if someone does not run to the door immediately to just keep pressing the bell and waiting. We will be there. Welcome to First Parish, Unitarian Universalist Northboro. We, there's another announcement. Yes, uh, after that, things will begin this Saturday from 9 to 11 at the Universalist. This Saturday, 2 to 4.30 in the parish house, there will be contra dancing. So, The schedule for the year will go out in our Tuesday newsletter. Put on your dancing shoes and come on over. We Unitarian Universalists are a non-credal, religiously liberal faith tradition. We hold in our worship and in our faith formation that each individual and each community will explore a wide and varied set of beliefs and ideas that encourage us to live life as a spiritual journey, deepening our connections to compassion, justice, and an understanding of eternal truth. Uh, I am Reverend Abigail Stockman, the interim minister. If you have any questions about Unitarian Universalism or First Parish Church, please don't hesitate to be in touch with me or with any of the lay, letter, lay leaders, board members, or folks attending, sitting in the pew next to you. We begin our prelude this morning. The choir leads us in the hymn number 10, 1043 in the Teal hymnal, turquoise hymnal. See, we can't even agree on the color. <laughs> and uh, it's called Seke Aldash. And we, uh, it is sung in both Hungarian and English. 
It is uh, from our Transylvanian Unitarian churches. It is a prayer of theirs set to music by uh, Elizabeth Norton, who leads music at our congregation in Concord, Massachusetts. We will, the choir will lead us in the prelude, singing it in Hungarian and then singing the English words. And uh, then we will invite everyone to sing it together. And that means you, please rise at that point in body as you are able and everyone in spirit and let us sing in English. And then we will sing it through one more time and you will sing in English. Uh, except those of you who wish to sing in the Hungarian, please feel free to join along. Let there be joy in our coming together. Let there be truth <clears throat> heard in the words we speak and the songs that we sing. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and disrepair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. Those were the words of Carl Seberg. May the light of this flame illuminate our lives and strivings of the spirit. May it heal misunderstanding and strengthen love. Please rise in body, spirit. Uh, please rise in spirit, body, as you are able. I was about to say spirit as you are able. 
And I hope all your spirits are able to rise this morning, if only just a little bit. And let us sing together our opening hymn number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. Our readings this morning are excerpts from the, a variety of op-eds published this week. My apologies to the authors for picking only bits and pieces out of context. The first is an excerpt from the New York Times opinion editorial of October 13th, 2023 by Nir Avishay Cohen, a major in the reserves for the Israeli Defense Forces and author of Love Israel, support Palestine. I was in Austin, Texas for work on Saturday when I received a call from my commander at the Israeli Defense Forces to return to Israel and head to the front line. I didn't hesitate. I knew that the citizens of my country were in real danger. During my long flight to Israel, my mind couldn't rest. There's nothing in the world that can justify the murder of hundreds of innocent people. But I'd like, to say, <clears throat> I'd like to say one thing clearly before I go to battle. There is no such thing as unavoidable. This war could have been avoided, and no one, no one did enough to prevent it. Israeli, Israel did not do enough to make peace. Palestinians aren't the enemy. The millions of Palestinians who live right here next to us, between the Mediterranean Sea and Jordan, are not our enemy. Just like the majority of, of, just like the majority of Israelis want to live a calm, peaceful, dignified life, so do Palestinians. Israelis and the Palestinians alike have been in the grip of a religious minority for decades. On both sides, the intractable positions of a small group has dragged us into violence. It doesn't matter who is more cruel or more ruthless. The ide ideology of both have fueled this conflict, leading to the death of too many innocent civilians. At the end, after all the dead Israelis and Palestinians are buried, after we have finished washing away the rivers of blood the people who share a home in this land will have to understand that there is no other choice but to follow the path of peace. That is where true victory lies. This is from Charles M. Blow, uh, another New York Times opinion columnist, uh, ending his October 8th, 
28, sorry, October 18th, 2023 piece, an evolving moral high ground in the Israeli-Gaza war. With these two statements, he ended. In our country, the United States of America, many people are simply trying their best to make sense of a complex situation and coming to a conclusion that the context of the conflict, both historical and present, muddies the moral waters. All infliction of human suffering is wrong, and we should all be willing to be able to object to and resist it whenever we see it, no matter who imposes it or who endears it, endures it. In this space, we can witness to one another's aliveness, to the strength of the spirit of life through the sharing of personal joys and sorrows, knowing that a deep personal joy shared aloud can increase joy in the universe, and that a deep personal sorrow shared opens the gathered community to an opportunity to hold us in prayers of strength and courage as we face our sorrow or grief. All that has been shared here this morning alongside those joys and sorrows that remain silent within us, the deep calls for peace, Let us remain seated as we join together in singing, Draw the Circle Wide. The words will appear on the screen. We begin our time of prayer and <clears throat> reflection with a sung offering by the choir so that you may, just in case you can't hear the words, they, they will be up on the screen so that you can read them as the choir sings.
please stay in the silence. Breathing in and breathing out, washing the cells of your being with the silence of this place. May our hearts be open. Amen. When you are ready, open your eyes and bring yourself back into this space. How blessed are we to be able to consider how much we will give today. We are blessed with the freedom to make this decision for ourselves without the force of government nor religious hierarchy requiring set amounts. We are blessed even when our resources are minimal to be able to make the choice about where to contribute our finances, our time, and our energies. This congregation recognizes and gives thanks for these blessings by sharing half of each Sunday's plate collection with another organization doing the work of love, justice, and compassion in the world. The half plate for the month of October goes to the Nipmuc Indian Development Corporation. The mission of the Nipmuc Indian Development Corporation is to assist in the revitalization of the Nipmuc Indian community through the promotion and provision of culturally appropriate community and economic development programs. If you wish to learn more, you may go to their website. In the spirit of this free church tradition, 
the financial offering that assists this church in operating will now be gratefully received uh, by this morning's greeters who were not named. So I'd like to thank both uh, Dick and Andrew Zuchowski as they collect the offering this morning. And, <laughs> and in golden yellow today. Let us say a collective thank you out loud for what we have received today. Thank you. One more reading from the Washington Post opinion columnist Danielle Allen in this last week on October 15th. Again, these are excerpts. Often in times of trouble, we will hear a politician say that the arc of the moral universe is long, but bends towards justice. I've always had a bleaker view, she writes. I see our many human societies as living on a metaphorical sphere that is half in light and half in dark. The best goal of human striving is to live in the light and to help one's own society and other societies to live in the light. But always and forever, there are forces that pull people and societies toward or down into the darkness. To live in the light is to respect human dignity, she continues, to recognize and strive to protect basic rights, to empower people to make decisions in their own lives privately and together in public life through democratic forms of governance to resolve conflict via nonviolent means, 
to establish the conditions in which safety and well-being for all in a society can emerge. Where rule is for the benefit of the ruled, not the rulers. For a society to live in the light is for it to claim these orienting ideals and seek to adhere to them. This, the effort inevitably falls short. Living in the light also entails a perpetual internal desire for self-correction. Thus ends the reading. Seventeen years ago this month, the issue in our country on the front page of the paper was the right to torture in pursuit of justice regarding the perpetrators and organizers of the horrific events of September 11, 2001. I wrote a sermon in response to the then recent news that Meyer Arar, a Canadian citizen who had been born in Syria and was a software engineer, had been arrested the previous year by the US government while he was changing planes in New York. Mr. Arar was arrested and uh, taken to Syria. There, he was tortured in a Syrian prison as a suspected al-Qaeda terrorist for over a full year. There, in Syria, he was held without due process and tortured with no access to any recourse. At the time, I wrote a sermon asking what was our call as Unitarian Universalists, as people of faith, faith that the moral arc of the universe can indeed bend toward justice even if it does not always do so. How should we, Unitarian Universalists, who easily name our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of all people. How would we express our faith in this principle and this value about other human beings in light of what our government had sanctioned? Though I do not hold that life is so simple as Alan's opinion articles make it indistinguishing only between dark and the light. And I am also mindful that as a white person using light and dark as metaphors is problematic in raising images of systemic racism among us. But the dark light metaphor is also troubling because, frankly, life is not often that clear. Instead, we often encounter life at the edges where there's a great deal of shadow and grayness. The shadows and the grays make it hard to distinguish wherein lies the light or the dark. Poet Clint Smith notes in one of his poems, quote, sometimes the moral arc of the universe does not bend in a direction that will comfort us. Sometimes it bends in a ways we don't expect, and there are people who fall off in the process. Please, dear reader, do not say I am hopeless. I believe there is a better future to fight for. He 
he writes. I think what we need in those moments is a compass to help us discern our way toward what Alan calls the light. And what she describes as a society in the light very much reflects our Unitarian Universalist values and principles. What is our moral compass, our principles, and our values of this faith? But to believe in something is different than to act with faith. To act with faith from those principles when our feelings and emotions and confusion and lost in shadows or fogs calls us to do otherwise. We often lay our moral compass aside, simply out of our humanness. And we do that age old thing, we react. A reaction is not the same as a response. Reaction has several uh, definitions, but it defines behavior, often as against a different behavior. As a teenager, I often reacted to my parents' requests by doing the exact opposite of what they had asked. You may all count your blessings that I was not your teenage daughter 60 years ago. A reaction may be an unpleasant effect of something as in a chemical reaction. The reaction of mixing vinegar and baking soda that produces the rapid white foaming of the vinegar. The news of the world around us displays abundant examples of the reactions that result from the ongoing human tensions among the people living in political Israel and the people living in political Gaza. In our con current culture here in the United States and in most of what we call the Western world, rational, thoughtful, reasoned words hold much less value than they did in our recent past. Instead, our reactions are lured and captured by intentionally graphic photos, pithy, value-laden slogans, and emotive headlines. These methods are used equally well by Fox News and NPR. The lure that gains our attention are the emotions that such photos, slogans, and headlines arouse within us. And our human tendency, once we are in the grip of a particular emotion, is to then use our reasoning abilities not to consider all the options, but to confirm what the emotion we feel is already telling us. To respond may mean to have a reaction, but it also may mean to answer. To be responsive is to provide an answer to something. And to provide an answer requires that we think and reason, recognizing our emotions, naming them, but not giving them the power 
to overcome our reason. To think of being responsive is to think through the emotions aroused, to consider, to become curious about, and to explore in the way that I am using it here this morning. To consider the subject at hand from a number of perspectives before offering a response, including the perspective of those who may be on the other side. And then to think about how to respond from our faith. And as was heard here this morning during Joys and Sorrows, our faith does call us to peace. Perhaps not as strongly as the peace traditions of the Amish, the Mennonites, the Quakers, and, and their brethren in faith. But still, peace is one of our deeply held values, as is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, every person, not just the ones we agree with. Right now, that is a very difficult place to live and to be human. We are most of us outsiders to the conflict between the people in political Israel and the people living in political the Palestinians living in political Gaza and outside of Gaza. But that doesn't mean we can't, because of our faith, work to build peace and to honor the inherent worth and dignity of every person We will not be doing it in Israel or in Gaza, but we can do it here. We can begin to do it within ourselves as we face emotions that call us to bypass our reasoning and instead just find easily grabbable reasons to confirm our emotions. We can do it here in our community of faith with one another when we don't understand, when we disagree, when that thought crosses our mind that that person sitting next to us who sometimes makes us crazy, really is full of inherent worth and dignity. Even if they drank their coffee from the wrong kind of cup last Sunday. We can do it here in, our, in your political community of Northboro. You can do it here in outreach to the parts of this community that are not given their full inherent worth and dignity, not given the resources, not given the full access to the benefits of our democracy. You can do it here with those who are new to this community. Those are acts of faith. They are hard. 
And sometimes they cause us to deal with complicated issues, the difference between what our feelings tell us and what our faith calls us to do. In the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, there are several times when God, the main character, wants to do away with creation. You may be familiar with some of those stories, and you may not, but I think the story of Noah is one which most of us are familiar with. God decides that it's time to flood the earth and get rid of all of creation because creation is not acting well. It's acting evilly. It's inclined evilly. And so God says in Genesis 6, 7, 8, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I've created people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry I made them. But Noah, for some reason, found favor in the sight of the Lord, goes Genesis 6, 7, 8. So God tells Noah to build an ark, and he builds the ark, and he and his wife and his children and their families and two animals from every possible uh, animal come onto the ark and they're saved and all of creation is destroyed. We've heard word in the last week, in the last months, in the last years, about people who want to destroy someone else's created culture, life, family, being, country. Noah just did what he was told. The ark was built, everything else was destroyed. Eventually the flood goes away and Noah and his family and the animals repopulate the earth. We may sometimes feel like Noah, that there is nothing we can say or do that will change the circumstance. And indeed, there may be moments when the arc of justice, when the arc of the universe does not bend toward justice. And we have to witness it. And it is painful. Noah repopulated the earth. There was a rainbow of peace when the ark landed and the rain stopped. Nothing stays static. I do not have answers for us. I do not invite us to take sides in today's conflict. But I invite us to continue to act out of our faith in every moment that we are able to call ourselves into it in our own lives, because it's not easy. And in so doing, we are bending the arc of the universe towards peace, towards justice. The song we began with today said, faith brings love, brings peace, and blessing. May it be so for us. Amen.
Please rise in spirit, body as you are able, so that we may sing together that protest song, We Shall Overcome. What we need to overcome now is that reactive part of ourselves that we may act instead from faith. Number 169 in the blue hymnal, in the gray hymnal. Boy. Gray. Gray, gray, gray. We carry this flame of peace and love until we meet again. The strength of love is increased by each little act on behalf of life. Life isn't changed instantaneously by large leaps or statements of loyalty. It grows slowly from each small act of faith, of love, of peace, and of blessing. Universalist John Murray wrote in the end of the 18th and early 19th century, give them not hell, but hope and courage. Preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. Go in peace. Amen.